Hey, this is Mr. Leach with Simpson Math, and today we are going to be talking about Riemann's sum. What Riemann's sum is, it's a way to estimate the integral, where the integral is the area between a function and the x-axis. The way Riemann's sums works is it uses rectangles, or even in some cases trapezoids, to estimate the area. The benefit of using rectangles or trapezoids, it just relies upon your knowledge of basic geometry and functional inputs and outputs. We'll be looking at a few cases of Riemann sums. We'll be comparing the difference between the upper sum and the lower sum, and looking at the benefit of the trapezoidal sum. There are also three other sums. There's a left sum, a right sum, and a middle sum. GeoGebra does know the function, the left sum and right sum, and you can play with that a bit on your own. So let me teach you how to create this document. So let's start with a blank document. This is GeoGebra. I'm running the downloaded version. You can get this from GeoGebra.org. You can also run this directly from their website on a computer or tablet. When given the option, select Algebra. Hit the toggle down. And let's add our grid. I zoomed my graph in from negative 4 to positive 8 on the x-axis and negative 1 to 6 on the y-axis. Let's thicken up these axes a bit. Right-click anywhere and select Graphics. Under the axes options, let's bold up the axes and bold up the label size. It's just a little bit easier for you to see them. All right, let's first type in our polynomial. I could just type in our polynomial that we'll be using directly, but I actually want to create a program that will work for any cubic. So let's type in f of x equals, then just the letter a, then x cubed, so x caret 3, plus bx squared, plus cx plus d. So what GeoGebra is going to do with that is it knows that x is going to be the independent variable, but it doesn't know what those a, b, c, and d are. So it's going to create sliders. So hit enter, and it asks the question, do you want to create sliders for a, b, c, and d? And yes, you do. So here's our cubic if our function was x cubed plus x squared plus x plus 1. Now I actually want a to be negative 0.5, b to be 2, c to be negative 1, and d can remain at 1. And I'm going to color this function black and make it a little bit thicker. So there we have it. So there's our function. If you want to change this to be any other cubic polynomial, you can do so by just adjusting those sliders. Now we need to create two points on the x-axis. So let's click A, and we're going to add a point at negative 1, and add a point at 3. Select both A and B by holding down the Command or Control. And let's color these orange. What A and B are, they are the bounds of integration. We need to create another slider, so click on Slider. Click down here, just below D. And let's label this one in. And let's have it go from 1 to 50 by an increment of 1. We need these to be integers. So say OK. Click on N, and I actually want to color this one orange. And let's set N to be 5 for now. GeoGebra has built into it these Riemann sums. So let's first find the upper sum. So let's type in just the word upper sum in all lowercase. Notice when you type in UPP, GeoGebra is trying to give you a hint and help you out, saying, oh, I know something that looks like this, which we'll be using that in just a sec. But I just want to be typing out a variable for it that we can call up later. So upper sum, all lowercase equals, so capital U, PP, um, you could type it out with a capital U and capital S, or you can just click on it, or hit enter. The benefit of this, instead of just typing it in yourself, is that when you select that hint, it's going to basically give you little fill in the blanks. So it's asking for what's the function. We named our function F, so type in F, and then hit tab. So it says, what's the start x value? Well, that's the x value of a. If I just type in a, that's not going to work for me because a has two numbers associated with it because it's a point, it's a coordinate. It has an x and a y. I just want the x, so I'm actually just going to type in x of a. Hit tab. I need the end x value, so that's going to be x of b. Hit tab, and then our number of rectangles, that's the n. That's where that slider is. Now hit enter, and you can see here that this is the upper Riemann sum. So what it does, so first it divides our interval from 1 to 3 into 5 equal parts. 
then looks at the first section, finds the maximum. Since within this interval, it's continuously decreasing, it's just this value on the left. Over here on this right, it's hard to see, so I'll zoom in on it. But if you notice, you'll notice that within this last rectangle, the maximum is not at the beginning part or ending part. It's actually somewhere in the middle, so that's why it uses that maximum. In order to calculate this upper sum by hand, you would have to divide this into equal parts. If I was to be doing it by hand, I would probably be doing eight segments, because that's just easy division. Then I have to determine in this first rectangle, where's the maximum? And then, since it's just this value on the left, I would just plug in f of negative one, and that's the height of the rectangle. And I know that this rectangle is 0.5 wide, so it's this height of the rectangle, times 0.5. Then do the same thing for the next one. The maximum is this value right here, so that height times 0.5. You continue this for each of the rectangles. Usually it's just going to be f of one of your boundary lines of the rectangles, but sometimes it's going to be one of the local maximum. Once you get the areas of all eight rectangles, you then just add them up, and that would be your estimate for the integral. Now what do you think is a problem with this approach? Yeah, you should be seeing this is an overestimation. This upper sum will always be an overestimation. And yeah, that's a problem. So there should be a way to fix that, and we'll get to that in a little bit. So if we have an upper sum, there's also a lower sum. So let's do the same thing. So da down in the input bar, let's type in lower sum, all lowercase letters, equals, and now let's do capital L, lower sum. Select the function, and this time we have function f, Start value x of a, in value x of b, number of rectangles in. And so here we have our lower sums. First, a little bit of cosmetics. Notice we have this text that's overlapping it. So let's turn off the text on both of these. So it's say hidden, and click on the upper sum and say hidden. And then let's change these colors. Let's have the upper sum be blue, and the lower sum be red. All right, so what do you think a problem with the lower sum is? Yeah, our lower sum is always going to be an underestimate. And do notice here that the lower sum stops at this local minimum. Not one of the endpoints, but that local minimum. There are three other common rectangle approaches. One is the midpoint, which, to my knowledge, GeoGebra doesn't have that function. The other two are the left rectangle and the right rectangle. If I had to do a Riemann sum with rectangles by hand, I would do either the left or the right rectangle because I don't have to worry about the local minimums or local maximums. I just have to plug in f of these boundary lines. I'll leave that to you to play with the left sum and right sum once this video is finished. We're going to be calculating a lot of different values and I want to be able to view them all at a glance. So select on the text tool. I'm clicking at about four or five and a half. And this first one, this is going to be the upper sum. So I'm just going to type in upper sum, this time with a space. So this is just whatever text I want to. This isn't a part of any function. So just upper sum, space, equals space. And now I'm going to click on upper sum over on the left. And you notice here that it's kind of in a box. It's saying, oh, that's that variable that you named. And we can see it's previewed that it will be the 10.39. And so say OK. So click back on the text. And let's pick large, very large, and extra large is really large. And let's color this blue to correspond with our graphics. And as a nice and as a nice touch, I'm going to have the background be shaded a light blue as well. Let's repeat this process for the lower text. Click over here on the size. Let's go ahead and make it large, so that way every time we use this tool, the text should already be set to large. So click. So let's say lower sum, space equals space, or lower sum, and say OK. Click on the arrow, click on the text, and let's color this one red. What do you think is going to happen with the relationship between upper and lower sum as the size of n increases? So as n increases, what do you notice about these two? Yeah, they're gradually getting closer and closer and closer to each other. So let's calculate their difference. Down the input bar, let's type in diff equals upper sum minus lower sum. Now when I'm typing in upper sum, it's suggesting, oh, you should use this function. I'm not needing this function again because I've named a variable upper sum all lowercase. 
So notice once I type in that last M, the text pops to blue. That's GeoGebra's way of saying, oh, I know what that is. That's a variable that you've defined. So upper sum minus lower sum. Again, all lowercase. And notice again, it turns blue. Hit enter. So here you can see our difference is calculated right now at 3.3. And let's add that text as well. Let's leave this as black, but let's just color in the background to be a gray. So again, let's increase in, and, and you notice that as we increase in, the difference between these two does get smaller and smaller and smaller. Even with 50 rectangles, the difference between these two methods is off by 0.53. Since the upper sum always overestimates, and the lower sum always underestimates, what's something that we could do to sort of kind of help them meet in the middle? Yeah, we could average these two methods. So let's do that. Let's call something the average sum. So just AVG sum is, and it's going to be the average of upper sum and lower sum. What's the statistical way of averaging? It's the mean. So let's type in mean, pick that first option. So mean of, and I'm just going to type in our variable upper sum. Notice it's blue, comma, lower sum. Notice again, it turns blue, and press enter, and there's our average of the two sums. So let's put this text on. So let's see how well this average sum compares with the actual integral. So to do this, down the input bar, type in capital F equals, and then integral, I-N-T. Notice when I type in I-N-T, it pops up a whole bunch of options. We'll be using this third one integral of a function between this value and that value. So it's like that one. So integral of f from x of a to x of b. And remember just hitting tab to move between those spaces. And hit enter. So I'm going to turn off the lower and upper sum. And you notice that it actually did calculate the integral there. Calculated it in that ugly orange. So I'm going to actually color this green and turn off the text. So that is the integral, this 8.67. So let's add this text over to the right. So notice this 8.67 is really close to that 8.67. So do you think that they actually are equaling each other there? They're actually probably just really close to each other. Let's increase our rounding to five decimal places. To do that, click on Options, which is just off of my screen. Select Rounding, and then let's select five decimal places. Five decimal places is enough to see that they don't exactly equal, but they're really close to each other. What do you think would happen between the relationship between the average sum and the integral when I reduce the number of rectangles? Yeah, they're not going to be as exact, but it's going to be pretty close. Even back at 10 rectangles, it's not even off by a tenth. And that's pretty impressive. One last thing, and Riemann sums can actually be calculated using trapezoids. These trapezoidal sums is actually going to be really close to this average sum. So let's calculate and take a look and see what's happening. So let's type in trap sum equals, and then capital T, and you'll see that trapezoidal sum right here. Let's pick that. And so again, function f, starting at x of a, ending at x of b, with n trapezoids. Hit enter, and there's our trap sum. Let's color this pink, and let's add text to the right. It's a little bit hard to see with these 10 rectangles, so let's back up to just five rectangles. And you can see this trapezoid in action. Let's look at this first trapezoid. Here, this first trapezoid is just slightly overestimating that section, but it does a whole lot better job than the upper sum by itself or the lower sum by itself. Now, if you notice, the average sum and trapezoid sum are pretty close to each other. They're off by like four hundredths. The reason why they're off is because the upper sum and the lower sum uses the extremum whereas the trapezoids will just use the boundary lines between the trapezoids. I zoomed in on the minimum, and you can see that the trapezoid goes from this boundary line to this boundary line, whereas the 
average of the upper sum and the lower sum uses this minimum. So the area of the average is, is just going to be a little bit smaller than the area of the trapezoid in this case, but not by much. The benefit of using the trapezoidal sum as opposed to the average sum is that if you're doing this calculation by hand, you only have to do one set of calculations and you don't have to worry about the extremums. So now that you have this program built, you can do a few things. One, you could include the left sum and the right sum if you want to see the way that that behaves. Also, you can play around with n. Do notice that when n is small, the difference between the upper sum and the lower sum is really big, and our estimates are pretty poor. But as n increases, even just slightly, for our average and trapezoidal sums, those estimates are pretty good approximations of the actual integral. And especially as n gets really big, those are really good approximations of the actual integral. And think about this. When n approaches infinity, what would happen to all of these methods? As n approaches infinity, these are all going to be getting closer and closer and closer to the integral. That's basically what the integral is. It's these methods just with infinitely small rectangles. A few other things that you could do. If you want to change the bounds of integration, you can just move a and b around. So let's say you wanted to go from negative 2 to 4. You can do that. And notice all these numbers on the right update live. Or suppose you had a different cubic, or maybe not even a cubic at all, but you had a quadratic or a linear function. You can just move these sliders, and again, all of our estimates change along with it. One last discussion, and that's with d. When d is negative 3.75, all the rectangles and trapezoids are below the x-axis. Now, area in geometry purposes can't be negative, but here we are calculating negative areas because it's the area below the x-axis. So here, the actual integral is negative 10.33 repeating. If d was negative 1, notice the actual integral is 0.66. Notice the actual integral is two-thirds. This integral has some positive parts, some negative parts, and some positive parts again. Those the parts below the x-axis are subtracted from the parts above the x-axis. All right, so that's it. I hope this program helps you understand the Riemann sums and ultimately integration a little bit better.